Hello, my name is Paul Jong On Lee. I'm taking the position of co chairperson of the Scientific Committee of GBCC 10. Hello, my name is Alistair Thompson. I'm Professor of Surgery at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, in the United States. So today, we'd like to cover some topics. Um, our first topic is sentinel lymph node biopsy indications in the adjuvant setting. So, for example, Dr. Alastair Thompson, um, what do you think about sentinel lymph node biopsy for the patients with T3 lesion? So, sentinel lymph node biopsy, as you are well aware, was originally established for early T1, T2 clinically node negative cancers. But I think many of us have extended the use of central lymph node biopsy to T3 lesions, particularly if we have the clarity with an ultrasound that suggests that in the axilla there does not appear to be any involvement of the axillary lymph nodes. So to summarize, Paul, I would say that for T3 lesions where there is no clinical or ultrasound evidence of nodal involvement, I personally would favor a central lymph node biopsy. What would you do? I agree with you. I don't think if the tumor is a little bit bigger than five centimeter is a contraindication to do the sentinel lymph node biopsy. But in case of inflammatory breast cancer or palpable lymph nodes, definitely with the skin fixation with the tumor, this kind of situation may be the contraindications. So I like to say, the indications for the sentient lymph node biopsy is really widespread. Yes, I agree. And for inflammatory breast cancer, what little evidence there is suggests that central lymph node biopsy is not a good or a proven way sure. to approach the exam. That's right. So according to the ECOSOG C11 results, recently the surgeons skipped the accelerated lymph node dissection with one or two metastases confirmed with the sentient lymph node biopsy. Can you add on that? I think there are uh, limitations to what was a very brave attempt with the Z11 trial to clarify whether we could do less axillary surgery rather than the standard axillary lymph node dissection. There is, as, as you may know, a trial which is underway and about two thirds complete from the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand called the, called the POSNOC trial, looking at positive nodes. And unlike Z11, that trial includes mastectomy patients. Unlike Z11, it's a requirement to do an ultrasound of the axilla uh, and to assess the lymph nodes that way as well. And then the final problem that many people have with Z11 is it's unclear what if any, was given in the way of radiation treatment to the axilla in, in many, as many as two thirds of the patients. So although the AMAROS trial, which was a beautifully conducted trial in Europe, um, appeared to tell us that surgery and radiation treatment to the axilla for low disease burden are equivalent, but surgery causes more morbidity, I think we still have much to learn in the setting of particularly mastectomy where one or two nodes are positive. What, what do you practice? What do you think? Uh, it's very difficult to follow the Amaros clinical trial. Actually, in my center, Samsung Medical Center, um, the therapeutic radiologist, they seems like they don't take the isolated radiation for axilla. So in other words, um, in case of mastectomy patient, the permanent sentient lymph node biopsy, it revealed there are one or two sentient lymph node metastases. It seems like our therapeutic radiologist would like to give radiation to the mastectomy bed, plus axilla. Yeah, so I think we have a lot to learn still, and I look forward to uh, both the POSNOC trial results, which will not be available for some time, but also thoughtful discussions such as you and I are having today and in a multidisciplinary framework to try to decide for individual patients 
what may be in her best interest. So the diagnostic radiologist in my center, the Samsung Medical Center, they are very diligently use the fine needle aspiration for the suspicious axillary lymph node in the preoperative ultrasound. So what do you think about the fine needle aspiration usage before the operation? For example, in triple negative breast cancer or hormone receptor negative HER2 positive breast cancer, if there is a metastatic lymph node confirmed in axilla, the surgeons can decide this patient would be better for the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But in the lumina type, if one or two metastatic sensing lymph nodes in axilla can be spared from the axilla lymph node dissection, if we consider the result from the ECOSOC Z11 clinical trial. So some doctors may say that there can be a different application rule for defined needle aspiration according to the subtypes. Yes, that's a great point. And, and first of all, I think biopsy of the axillary node is absolutely essential if you identify an abnormality. And although the evidence suggests that fine needle aspirate versus core needle biopsy is very comparable, many of the practices I have worked in, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom, have tended towards using core needle biopsy in that it gives a uh, more material. But I would say that a fine needle aspirate when conducted by an expert, uh, a, a talented and experienced radiologist can give very good results as well. So I have no criticism of that at all. What I would say is that for triple negative breast cancer and for HER2 positive breast cancer, is there is, if there is nodal involvement, Despite me being a surgeon, I would completely agree with you that neoadjuvant therapy is absolutely desirable. And that is partly because it will test the primary cancer, it will test the nodal disease with the treatments that you are using. And often, maybe in 40% of triple negative, maybe in 50 or 60% of HER2 positive disease, we may be able to downstage the axilla and then perform less extensive axillary surgery. I think as you point out that estrogen receptor positive disease is, is much trickier because whether we use chemotherapy or endocrine therapy, the chances of getting downstaging eradication of either the primary or the nodal disease are much, much less. So once again, we are agreeing uh, across the ocean. That's right, Alastair. So the next topic is um, the axillary dissection after the surgery of neoadjuvant chemotherapy setting. So after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, it is currently recommended to perform an axillary dissection in case of any residual tumor in sentient lymph biopsy, even in case of isolated tumor cells or micrometastasis, no matter what, how many cancer cells are seen, in case of positive sentinel lymph nodes, so go for the axillary lymph node section in case of neoadjuvant setting is the current recommendation. But as you may listen to the last week San Antonio plenary lecture, the professor Elizabeth Wittendorf, she said that the um, According to her center's data, a five-year disease-free survival rate is 88% in YPN0, 73.5% in YPN0I positive, and almost is the same, 74.7% .7 in YPN1 micrometastasis. So she said that Five-year disease-free survival is different in case of YPN0 and YPN very small. Respectively, it's 88% and roughly 75%. So based on that reason, she said that the surgeons go for the axillary dissection 
in case of any residual small numbers of metastatic cancer cells are seen in anti lymph biopsy. But according to her data, I found that five-year local regional recurrence free survival is the same, 95% to 96% in YPN0 to YPN micrometastasis. So our surgeons, we see the local regional control of the surgery or the radiation treatment and the effect of controlling the disease-free survival or overall survival can be influenced by the systemic treatment which is performed by the medical oncologist. In terms of the same outcome of five-year local regional recurrence-free survival according to YPN0, YPN isolated tumor cells, YPN1 micrometastasis, it's a little bit confusing to me. Can our surgeons go for the axillary lymph node dissection in every case of small tumor burden of the sentinel lymph node biopsy after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy setting? I'd like to ask your perspective on that matter. Yes, thank you, Paul. As, as you suggest, this can be a very confusing place for us as surgeons and for our patients. And I like to think of there being four big variables here. The first is what do we do as surgeons? The second, what are the medical oncologists going to offer? But also very importantly, what radiation and how is that radiation going to be delivered? And then finally, to think about the morbidities, particularly in combining surgery with radiation treatment that we can cause if we are over enthusiastic with our surgery, uh, but we don't change the long-term outlook. So what do I mean by all that? What I'm suggesting is that there may be, may be patients where we can do less axillary surgery, but back that up with radiation treatment. And even if there is a low disease burden, it may be that clearing the axilla, axillary lymph node dissection, doesn't benefit the patient if the patient is going to get radiotherapy and modern drug treatment. Whereas you may, with a level two or level three dissection particularly, cause so much morbidity that the patient is miserable even though she is alive. Now there are two or three trials which are trying to address this problem. Can we do less treatment to the axilla after neoadjuvant therapy? There is an Alliance, American College of Surgeons trial. There is an NRG trial, again in the United States. And there's about to be a further trial called the ATNEC trial, which will be running in the United Kingdom and I think in other parts of the world as well. So I do not know the right way to treat patients with this problem of what do we do in the axilla, but I do know that we need to be very thoughtful. We need to work as a team with our patient, with our medical oncology colleague, with our radiation oncologist to try to make sure that we gauge the appropriate extent of surgery in the light of the other treatments. And we counsel our patient that there may be consequences to more treatment, but also we've got to get the balance right between over-treatment and under-treatment and making sure we do the right thing for her. That's right. So there is a lot to think about, Paul, when it comes to the axilla, as we know. Yes, that's right. So I'm really, really looking forward to listening to your lecture in the next GBCC 10. So recently, I am experienced, I experienced a patient with the HER2 subtypes, ERPR negative, HER2 strong positive, but unfortunately, she had a supraclavical lymph node metastasis. So it seems like her staging at the diagnosis is stage 3C or even suspicious 4. So she had a large lesion in her breast and axillary lymph node metastasis confirmed with fine needle aspiration and supraclavical supraclavical lymph node metastasis confirmed also with the fine needle aspiration. So I sent her to our medical oncologist 
after our multidisciplinary team discussion. And then TCHP, six cycles were given. But as you may expect, 75% in this case of subtypes, TCHP six cycles achieve PCR. So after six cycles of TCHP, it seems like her supraclavicular lymph nodes are gone. And axillary lymph node metastasis, it seems like it's resolved. And there is no tint of breast lesion. So in this case, I just went for the breast conserving surgery after a while localization of the clipped breast lesion. And then I went for the sentinel lymph node biopsy, but I didn't go for the sentinel lymph node biopsy frozen because it seems like if there is a sentinel lymph node metastasis confirmed, like uh, isolated tumor cells or micrometastasis, it seems like it means if her tumor cells are still reside in her axilla, it's, it's the same that her tumor cells have the same chance to still reside in her supraclavicular lymph node. So I think there is no role for the axillary dissection. If we go for the level two or level three axillary lymph node dissection, there can be still chance of the tumor cells reside in her supraclavicular lymph node. So I just finished it, sentinel lymph node biopsy, and I stopped, and the final pathology was negative. So she achieved PCR in that case. So what do you experience, what do you, what do you like to say in those kind of cases? I think, Paul, that is wonderful for the patient, and that is a tribute to the power of modern anti-HER2 therapy. But it is also a tribute to the power of you as a surgeon to do less when you could have been in other circumstances doing too much surgery that might not benefit the patient. And particularly on the question of frozen section of the axillary nodes, after neoadjuvant therapy, we are giving the pathologists a very, very tough task to tell us if there is tumor there or not. As we both know, after neoadjuvant therapy, where there has been originally tumor in the lymph nodes, you can see all sorts of bizarre and strange forms um, of cellular material, which may not be tumor. And so it, it really does need the special stains, the CK5, CK6, and some of the other stains that they use to, to try to work out, are the isolated tumor or clumps of tumor cells there, or are the simply histiocytes and bizarre cell forms as a consequence of the drug treatment that has been given. So I like your approach. I feel I would have done the same. And, and like you, I would have been very, very happy if my patient had disease eradication because of the drug treatment. Wonderful news for her. Thank you. So it seems like we covered most of our topics we shared before. May I ask one more your opinion on the classification issues? So last summer, in JCO, Journal of Clinical Oncology, the, Dr. Monica Morrow published a fine review paper regarding the surgery after the nourishment chemotherapy. And she quote that the any suspicious microclassifications should be removed despite of chance of mastectomy. But especially in this case, HER2 subtypes, for example, ERPR negative and HER2 positive subtypes, just go for the 75% to 80% of PCR achievement after the treatment with the TCHP6 cycles. Maybe the cancer cells are all dead, but microclassifications are still reside. In that case, microclassification is not alive. So 
if there is, just for example, there is a six centimeter wide micro classifications, and we clipped in the center of the six centimeter lesion, but after Neuschwund chemotherapy, there is no enhancement in MRI, and ultrasound, it disappeared, but according to the mammogram, there is still six centimeter size micro classification. My approach recently is go for her with the excisional biopsy concept. So to take about two centimeter diameter tumor in the center of the, that lesion, the clip. So I sent that specimen to our pathologist and if there is a PCR result according to the permanent section, I just may reside the micro classifications with a thorough follow-up with the mammogram as well. So I'd like to ask your perspective because we are the same the breast cancer surgeon, right? So would you please share your opinion on that? Yes, thank you, Paul. I like your approach. I think it is taking a large sample, a large surgical sample, to check whether there is any residual disease. There are perhaps two other comments that I think we should consider. The first is, as you say, often the microcalcification does not disappear despite the use of chemotherapy. And we know very little about the consequences of any microcalcification or even DCIS that is left behind because these patients are often irradiated. And as we know, radiation treatment is a very good way to deal with DCIS. The other uh, nuance, the other angle to this, as you well know, there has been a move towards trying to do no surgery after exceptional response to drug therapy. And particularly in the HER2 setting, it may be that biopsy of the tumor bed which would need to be quite large bore biopsy, and perhaps before the biopsy, ensuring as you do in Korea, and so doing the MRI to give you extra information on top of ultrasound, on top of mammograms, that that combination may get us to the point where we can be more confident that there is no residual disease. So with respect to, to Professor Morrow, who is a very learned, very experienced surgeon in New York, I think the world is changing, and just as her views are to be respected, I think it is through the hands of surgeons such as yourself that we are going to move the needle forwards, that we are going to um, introduce further refinements and perhaps do less resectional surgery in these patients who have such exceptional responses. So I like your approach. I think I would view things in a very similar way. And in future, other surgeons who follow us will probably look back at these times and think how curious it was that we were doing so much surgery to, to some patients. I totally agree with you. And let me have one more question. So it's just kind of sharing our opinion with you. So um, the Definition of PCR in breast, it contains, there are no tumor cells, but it contains also DCIS. So in my opinion, if breast lesion is gone because the outcome of the YP breast nothing and YP breast DCIS is the same. The outcome is the same, very nice. 90% of survival rate. So in that case, the margin definition, I mean, resection margin. So the principle of no tumor cells on the inked margin in primary breast conserving surgery setting can be differently applied in the nourishment breast conserving surgery setting, especially in case of breast lesion achieved PCR with the residual DCIS because in that case, the lesion converted to DCIS from the invasive 
and the margins can be involved with TCIS cells. But still, there is a chance of the control by the radiation treatment. It can be a little bit dangerous. It can be a little bit too early to mention on that. But especially in breast PCR with the DCIS, the DCIS in margin of the breast conserving surgery, that can be a different meaning with the primary surgery setting or neoadjuvant breast cancer, neoadjuvant chemotherapy setting. So what do you think on that issue? You're right that the margins question continues to vex us. And although there are good guidelines that many of us follow around the world from many organizations thinking about margins for primary surgery, what the margins should be after neoadjuvant therapy are less certain. And so if there is DCIS at the margin after neoadjuvant therapy and no invasive disease, we know that DCIS does not kill people, but we have tended to overtreat, re-excise those patients. And I don't know whether that is the right or the wrong thing to do, recognizing as you do, that radiation is also a very strong treatment for DCIS. So this is an area which I think I do not have a, a final answer to but I think it's the sort of area that we need to explore as an international community. And whether it's through uh, observing what we do and comparing and contrasting the results, or whether it's through developing trials, randomized trials to address this sort of problem, I think you and I, Paul, need to think hard about how we can support the community to, to try to answer these questions definitively. So do you have any additional topic or add, do you like to add any comments on that? The only other comment I would make is I think we've covered a lot of ground. This is an area that is going to continue to be discussed. And I hope ongoing discussions between you and I and our friends and colleagues around the world will solve some of these dilemmas that we face with our patients. And in the meantime, I would like to wish you well, wish everybody in your, your family, in your society, the best of health. And I hope that we will together beat this pandemic and ensure that we can go back to um, dealing with the problems of breast cancer in everyday life together. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Keep safe, keep calm and be strong. I will, and to you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.